Good morning. Uh, our reading today is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the, where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with him when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you. It's a great scripture. It says a lot that's in here. Set the stage of what this kind of looks like at this time. Word has spread among the disciples that Jesus has come back from the dead. Word has spread. Throughout that first day, Mary and the other women who had been with her had spread the word. They had seen Jesus. We've seen him. They'd rush back to tell Peter and John who had come running to the empty tomb. Cleopas and the other disciple saw and talked to Jesus on the road to Emmaus, broke bread with Jesus, and then realized, oh my goodness, that's Jesus. And they came running back to tell the 12. I don't know how many miles that was, probably like a 5K. But still, I mean, that's pretty good excitement. Still, when they are gathered in the house that evening that this story recounts to us, only Cleopas and the other disciple had actually seen Jesus. None of the other ones had. Nobody else had seen him. But they were gathered because they believed what the witnesses had told them. They believed something, but Mary and the other ladies and Cleopas and the other disciple, something has occurred, and they said we should get there, so we're going to get here. Can you imagine, just one of the things you know about me by now is my imagination tends to run wild when, when I'm preparing and thinking about these scriptures. So the scriptures don't teach anything about this, but, but for me, I like to think about the conversations that were in that room right then, right? You just really think about what were they saying? Hey, did Mary Magdalene really see him? Really? Cleopas, did you, was that really Jesus that was walking with you? Did you really talk with him? Did he really break bread for you? Did you really not recognize him? He was uncle. Come on. Peter and John both say they saw the empty tomb. Maybe we should have gone and had a look at it ourselves. And then kind of the better one, well, we're all here. 
Did he really say he was going to come here and meet us? Among all the other ones. And somebody was watching by the window because they it says the scripture said they closed the door for fear of the Jews. So, so there's probably somebody like, ah, nobody's coming yet. We're okay. So all these kind of conversations that are happening. I think there was also a sense of expectation. And that's why they were gathered here. Matthew recounts it like this. Suddenly Jesus met them. He's talking about Mary and, and the other uh, the other ladies and said greetings and they came to him took hold of his feet and worshiped him then jesus said to them do not be afraid go and tell my brothers to go to galilee there they will see me so this is why they're all together okay you said we're going to see you we really don't know what that means we don't really understand at one point jesus will say i'm not a ghost give me some fish i'll eat some fish for you just to prove it's me because you're probably thinking I mean, is he going to come in this, this, this ethereal kind of drift in where you can see through him? Wouldn't that be kind of cool? It's like there's like, try to reach through. Oh, you don't, you're really not there. Again, pastor's imagination is a little bit out of control. But I imagine they were hoping to see something. I was reminded of um, that movie is full of wisdom and grace called the incredibles and in the incredibles there's a scene about midway through where mr incredible gets out of the car he closes it he's had a terrible day and he's hunched over and he turns around and there's a little boy on a tricycle and he looks at the little boy and says well what are you waiting for kid and the little boy responds and says I don't know, something amazing, I guess. And I kind of feel like that's where the disciples were. That's kind of how I feel it, right? They don't know what's coming. What are you guys, what are you waiting for? Something amazing, maybe. We don't know. But here's the funny thing. Our text gives us one detail about that first evening event. Thomas was not there. John tells us that after that meeting with Jesus, they told Thomas about it. But the better question that I think we want to ask is, why was Thomas not there? Well, everybody else is there. The word has spread. We're supposed to go and meet. Thomas doesn't show up. When Jesus and his disciples had gone to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. It was Thomas who didn't think this was a good idea. Let me, let me read this to you. This is out of uh, chapter 11, verse 14. Listen to what he says here. Um, well, let me read verse, uh, verse 13. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring to merely sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. In verse 16, Thomas who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas wasn't one of these disciples who took great leaps of faith or had tremendous belief. I mean, he followed Jesus and he believes the teachings. Sure, but Thomas was the pragmatic one. It's one of the reasons I like Thomas. Thomas was a realist. It's like I'm a realist. I get accused of being a pessimist, but I'm not. I'm just realistic about things. I'm just realistic. He's the one that hopes for the best, but always plans for the worst. There's nothing wrong with that. That's kind of, I mean, I... I I, I resonate with that. So now imagine what he's thinking on that evening of the first day of the week when they're all gathered that first time. Sure, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead along with he also raised the daughter of Jairus earlier on from the dead. But here's a fact that none of you seem to understand. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus raised Jairus, his daughter, from the dead. I'm not, and none of you all are Jesus. 
we can't raise Jesus from the dead. So if there's no Jesus, who's going to raise him from the dead? Who's going to do it? You, Peter? You, James? John? You guys wanted to call firebolts down on a Samaritan village. It's sure not going to be you doing great things for God. None of us can do that. So logically, there's no way this can be true. It can't happen. There's no way that Jesus can come back. There's no one to raise him from the dead. He's logically thinking this through. Plus, you guys all want to gather all in one place? Do you not know we're kind of being followed and watched and ready to be arrested ourselves? This is a bad idea for us all to gather together. So when you look at it this way, it kind of makes sense that the realest among them didn't come to the meeting. If you really look at it through Thomas's eyes, it starts to make a bit of sense. His response to the witnesses gathered of the gathered disciples is right in line with his personality. He's not the kind of person that just takes someone's story at face value, especially if it seems too good to be true. And yes, the raising from the dead of someone seems too good to be true. When his fellow disciples when he, tells, when he tells his fellow disciples that he simply can't get there, he can't believe that, that Jesus has come back unless he puts his finger in, in the nail holes and sticks his hand in the side. It sounds kind of crude, but what he's actually saying is, I'm going to really have to see this one for myself. But when he says these things, Thomas is simply being true to himself. He's being true to himself. But here's the point. Even though Thomas doesn't believe the reports, doesn't trust the truth of them, one week later, what does Thomas do? He shows up. He actually goes to the second meeting. A week after Easter, they're gathered again. Verse 26 of our text today. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. In spite of his doubts, in spite of his extreme difficulty in believing that any of this is true, he shows up. He still comes. Thomas has arrived doubting any of this is true, and he probably expects to be disappointed. This is a realist we're talking about. But here's the thing. Deep inside of him, I think there was a small nugget of hope. Of hope. I hope this is all true. I really just can't bring myself to believe that it is, but I kind of hope that it is. I hope it is. And then Jesus appears. And, in, and what's interesting is Jesus appears among them and goes straight to Thomas. Walks right to him. Verse 26 to 29. Let me read this to you. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. We have so often looked at this passage as a rebuke. Doubting Thomas. And we, we as people who have never actually seen the Lord, we look down on our noses. Well, how can, why, why can't you believe? Sad. Thomas, you walked with him for three years and you couldn't believe? Shame, shame, shame. We would do better, obviously, of course. And so we think that this is, always look at this as a rebuke to Thomas. 
It isn't. Thomas is not being rebuked for his doubts. First of all, Jesus is proving a point to Thomas. I'm aware of your doubts. I'm aware of them. Remember, Jesus wasn't physically present with the disciples when Thomas said, I can't get on board with this. I'm going to need to see those nail scarred hands and I'm going to need to see those feet and I'm going to need to see that side. That meeting had already broken up and he's telling them this. And what does Jesus do? Jesus goes directly to him. He goes up and invites him to see the wounds. Jesus is speaking directly to the thoughts and whispered prayers that Thomas had had the entire week. Now do you begin to understand why Thomas responds to my Lord and my God? Because no one could have heard that. There's no way Jesus could have seen it, heard it. And all the thoughts in his mind and heart throughout the week, no possibility. Unless, unless God was listening to my prayers. This is no condemnation, rebuke, or expression of disappointment. My friends, what this actually was is an action of deep mercy, grace, and compassion on someone who has come to the meeting in spite of his doubts. Thomas had made the initial step to come to the meeting, and Jesus responds by coming up to him and answering his doubts. Here's what I want to get across to you today. For far too long, we have looked at faith completely wrong. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's not. We see that so clearly here. Plenty of us, if we're honest, have doubts. We pray. We ask God to do things, but we wonder if those prayers will actually be answered. If we're honest with ourselves. We come to church full of our doubts, wondering if there's any point to this. We hear the tenets of our religion and wonder if any of it is really true. And we look at a world and doubt if God is even watching sometimes. Doubts assail us. And yet, and yet, and yet, something keeps bringing us back, doesn't it? In the middle of our doubts. The writer of Hebrews clearly understood this. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things do you know it? Hoped for. That hope carries us through our doubts. The central facet of faith is this. It's hope. Sometimes I can't see that it's all going to work out, but I hope to, so I continue to press forward. Even when our doubts assail us, we continue to return deep inside of us. Just like Thomas, there was that little nugget of hope and the faith we profess that pushes us through our doubts. And that, I think, is really what faith is. Faith is perseverance in the middle of or in spite of our doubts. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's perseverance in our doubts. You see it with Thomas. He still comes. He still shows up. And Jesus offers him this mercy and this compassion of answering prayers that he's been thinking and praying all week long. Trying to make ourselves certain. To quash our doubts as if they are something cancerous makes us, I think, less than human. It forces us to be something that we aren't, to be robotic and free of questions. But here's what I think the Lord would have you know today. Your doubts are okay. God is not offended by your doubts. God is not troubled by them. 
God embraces you even in your doubts. There's a great passage I, I want to read to you out of the book of Matthew. And I was talking to a friend of mine about this, and we were kind of somehow we discovered we were preaching on the same thing today. And this is out of Matthew chapter 28. This is one of the craziest things that I've read. 28 verses 16 and 17. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, not heard about it, not were told, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You are being told that doubt is a part of life and it's okay. Jesus did not rebuke them, and he does not rebuke us in our doubts. He simply says, come to me. Even in your doubts, I still want to wrap my arms around you and be compassionate to you and love you in the middle of them. Because there are times when we have no doubts. We're certain we feel the presence of God, and it's this wonderful experience. And then there are those times when it's like, hello. Anybody home up there? And it's in those times that God still says, I'm still here. I love you. I have never given up on you. And I am not afraid of your doubts. And I don't condemn you for them. God wants to embrace us in our good days, in our bad days, in our days of high belief, in our days of low beliefs. My friends, you are loved by God in good times and bad times. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Lord, we, we come to you today, sometimes believing in great things, sometimes struggling to believe at all. And in all these things, your compassion towards us never ends. Your mercy is everlasting. And Lord, we know that if, if your disciples who walked with you day after day after day for three years doubted and you didn't condemn them, then we know we have the same compassion and love for us. Be with us, Lord. Make your presence real to us. And envelop us in your arms of compassion when we are struggling. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Malcolm. Will you please Will you please join us for the singing of our last hymn? And I think it's a very appropriate hymn. Hymn number 505, When Our Confidence is Shaken. <laughs> 